The engineering behind space flight and how sometimes we don't get things quite as right as we ought to or would like to. The, first, the second half is about Mars. You've probably heard enough about that for one evening. This is about other spacecraft that have gone to other places in the solar system. I'm going to start with one that actually uh, is a, a truly international mission um, that's visited Saturn. And you may have seen pictures from Cassini-Huygens, a fantastic, fantastic mission. But not everything went exactly according to plan. Um, this little quote here um, is by... It's by a gentleman called John Zanecki, who actually works here at the Open University, describing one particular problem that happened with Cassini-Huygens. This is uh, Cassini-Huygens. Cassini is a large American orbiter sent on an enormous rocket to fly all the way to Saturn. And Huygens is the European part, which is this lander here, designed to land on one of Saturn's moons called Titan. And in fact, part of Huygens, part of the science package on board Huygens was built right here at the OU, the surface science package, and um, a guy called Ralph Lorenz, who was working here at the time, designed the very first man-made object to hit Titan, which was a penetrometer which sensed the, the force with which Huygens landed into the ground. Here's another picture of Cassini Huygens. In the NASA scale of things, you know, I told you that small rover is the size of a microwave. This orbit is the size of a school bus, um, and this lander is a couple of meters across. Here's a picture of the lander outside of its big heat shields deployed on the surface. Cassini Huygens was launched back in uh, 1997 and had a seven year cruise to get to Saturn. It took a very, very long time. And the original plan was for Cassini to come screaming in towards Saturn. Here's Saturn down here. Burn its main engine a long time to put itself into an orbit. Do a big fly out round here. Deploy Huygens and then follow Huygens. And Cassini would fly past Titan, one of Saturn's moons, and Huygens would land. And Cassini would relay the data from Huygens back down to the ground. This is kind of the, the, the geometry of that flyby. Here comes Huygens screaming in to land on Titan. And here comes Cassini flying past to relay the data. How there was a problem. The engineers in Europe did a test. What they did was they, using a de radio dish on the ground, they sent a signal to Cassini that would simulated what Huygens was going to sound like in terms of radio. And this rather messy graph shows the speed between Cassini and Huygens. And this graph shows the strength of that signal. And the test, the, the German people involved in the tests, you know, the, the Americans sent me, sent your signal, how did the test? And the Germans like, it's the test, it worked perfectly, fantastic. You got all the data? Nope. They got nothing. The test worked. Cassini didn't hear a thing. This strange red area is a combination of the vehicle either flying past one another too quickly or the signal not being strong enough such that Cassini could not have heard Huygens. And in fact, this line here is the area which Cassini-Huygens would have had to have operate. And so 80% plus of all the data would have been sent out by Huygens doing its job, sending out a radio signal. Cassini wouldn't have heard a damn thing. What they had to do without being able to touch the spacecraft, it was a billion kilometers away at the time, they had to figure out a way to get this and move it. So they redesigned the mission. They changed it. They didn't deploy Huygens on the first loop around the Saturnian system. They deployed it two orbits later. So as a result, Cassini didn't fly past really, really close to Titan. Cassini flew past much, much further away. So instead of zipping past at high speed, it cruised past much more gently. And as a result, they managed to move that green line way down into this area down here. As a result, Huygens worked beautifully. Here's a picture taken by Cassini of Huygens after it had been deployed to make sure it was on target. And here it is, kind of contrast reduced, so you can see the shape of the back of the thing. The weirdness didn't really stop with Cassini-Huygens at that point. Huygens deployed. It's, um, it had a heat shield, went through the atmosphere. Heat shield did its job. They deployed a parachute. Parachute did its job. And all the instruments were bolted to Huygens. They didn't have any kind of panning cameras or anything like that. So it relied on spinning gently under this parachute to take pictures as it floated down to the surface. And little fins that were mounted on the side of Huygens all the way around. This is the bottom of the, of the Huygens probe. In fact, this part here is the bit, bit built here at the OU. And those fins were designed so it would gently rotate. So the cameras could take picture after picture after picture, and those could be built up into a beautiful mosaic. This was the expected pre-flight speed of this spacecraft gently spinning. Reconstructed after the event, it did this. It span in exactly the opposite way. And they don't really know why. 
there's some conjecture that perhaps the shackle that was linking the parachute and the lander in some way got buckled up in some way. But they don't really know why the thing span the wrong way around. Fortunately, it span the wrong way around, but about at the same sort of speed that they were expecting it to spin in the first place, so the images could still be mosaic together. The fun with Huygens doesn't stop there. Here's the picture of Huygens, and it's two radio antennae. It had an A channel. One side of the radio was one type of radio, a very, very stable radio with a really, really stable frequency. And the other side was a less stable frequency. And what Cassini was going to do was listen in very carefully to the frequency at which this side was transmitting. And in the same way an ambulance makes a funny noise as it goes past, listening to Huygens, listening to the pitch of that radio, it could figure out how quickly it was moving, what the winds were like, and that sort of thing. However... The command to power on the ultra-stable oscillator, that's the receiver on Cassini, on the receiver side was, unfortunately, omitted. They didn't turn on the radio. <laughs> now, most of the scientists saw the two channels and they realized that they had some redundancy there. They could take all their pictures and send them on both channels so that if one radio died, they'd get it back on the other. The predominant instrument that didn't do that and saw two radios and thought, well, hey, twice as much data, were the cameras. Uh, the surface science package team from the OU, they sent their data on both channels. They got every single iota of data they were expecting. But some instruments lost half of their data. But the experiment wasn't entirely lost because whilst the A side wasn't received on Cassini, radio telescopes on the ground here received it loud and clear. Not loud enough to be able to pull out actual data, just loud enough to hear. It's like hearing a conversation but not being able to figure out what, it's, what they're saying. That's sort of that kind of annoying noise. But radio, radio telescopes in Australia and in, um, in uh, uh, America were both able to pick out the Huygens signal. This is like a 15-watt radio from about a billion kilometers away. It's an incredibly dim noise. But they managed to find that signal, follow that signal, and as a result, reconstruct how quickly... Huygens was drifting in the winds, and you could see at high altitude there's kind of like a, a jet stream equivalent on Titan. Now, one odd thing was that because the camera team were expecting all their images to go in one way as the thing panned around, they were put their pictures on the web, kind of accidentally, and enthusiastic amateurs like myself thought, well, we'll have those, thank you very much. But we didn't know it was supposed to go that way. We just stuck them together in whichever way made sense. As a result, amateurs started picking to get, putting together mosaics very, very quickly. This is actually an official mosaic from the science team, but this was a mosaic put together by an amateur that made it into all the national press the following day because the camera team hadn't figured out which way to put the mosaics at that point. And this is the finished view taken by Huygens sat on the surface, looking across the surface of Titan. These little rocks here are probably only about this sort of size. To get a sense of what this sort of view is like, lie down and put your head on the ground and you're looking about one eye's height off the deck. And conjecture is that this, the surface science package, the penetrometer that measured the, kind of the, the strength of the soil, actually first hit here and split this rock or this rock in half because there's a bit of a spike on that graph. Cassini itself has been working beautifully ever since, taking pictures like this of Saturn. It had a four-year primary mission. It completed that a few months ago. It's got a two-year extension and it will probably carry on for another four, five, maybe as much as seven years before, to make sure it doesn't crash into anything else, they actually crash it into Saturn and it will burn up. Bit of a, a sneak peek here. Cassini's been using radar to look at Titan. Titan itself is surrounded in really thick, dense clouds. We can't really see the surface, but using radar, you can bounce a signal off the ground and get a sense of what the ground is like, what the terrain is like. Using two different observations of this radar, a bit in the same way that we've got two eyes, you can get a sense of elevation. Now, this is towards the North Pole of Titan, and in fact, using radar, they've observed lakes. The dark area you'll see coming up on the right-hand side is actually an enormous lake. And it's not a lake, you know, it's not a, like a, a lake full of water. This is a lake full, of, basically, of lighter fluid. Meth uh, Titan has rocks, and it has fluids that do erosion, the same way we see them on Earth, but on Titan, the rocks tend to be ice, which is so cold it's as hard as rock and the fluids tend to be basically ethane, methane, lighter fluid type materials. If you're looking for beachfront property on Titan, uh, this is your spot. <laughs> Cassini was the second of the major flagship class missions to follow on from the Voyager missions of the 1980s. Galileo was the first. Galileo was about $2 billion worth of spacecraft, and it was the first spacecraft to revisit Jupiter after the Voyager spacecraft went there. 
Galileo, here it is. Here's a picture of Galileo with some uh, generic American scientists to scale. And this is its main antenna. You can see its main antenna is folded up there. And here it is fully deployed, kind of like an umbrella opening out. It had ribs and it had a mesh. And you're, th you're probably thinking that doesn't look much like a radio dish. Well, if you've got Sky Plus, you'll see that your radio dish is full of little holes. But the radio signal itself is bigger than the holes, so it bounces off the metal anyway. The same principle applies here. It's kind of like a, a mesh. Kind of think of like a, an umbrella made out of fishnet stockings, that sort of thing. But it works. Galileo was built way over here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. And it was launched on the space shuttle from the Kennedy Space Center here in Florida. And so in December 1985, they got Galileo, put it into the back of a truck, and drove it from JPL to the Kennedy Space Center ready for its launch. This is December 1985. January 1986, the Challenger disaster occurs. The space shuttle blows up, killing the astronauts. A, a, a tragedy for the American space program and a tragedy for the Galileo program because its launch vehicle was now declared unsafe. And not only was its launch vehicle declared unsafe, the upper stage, the extra boost it was going to get from Earth out to Jupiter was also declared unsafe as well. So they had to redesign the mission in a similar way they did with Cassini. So they drove it back from the Kennedy Space Center to JPL. Mid-1989, they put it back on a truck, drove it from JPL back to the Kennedy Space Center and launched it in October of 1989. And it used a weaker solid upper stage. We'll see why this is a bad thing in a moment. The mission became a bit of a circuitous route around the solar system. It launched in uh, 1989, uh, did one swing around the solar system, flew past Venus to get a bit of a kick, flew back past the Earth to get another kick, buy one, get one free, you get a free asteroid flyby if you get that far out into the solar system, another swing around, another Earth flyby, another asteroid flyby, one called Ida, all the way out to Jupiter, right here. The two Earth flybys, they turned on the instruments, just as an interesting experiment. Here's a picture of the Earth rotating under a full day. If you see this at full resolution, you can actually see the, a glint coming off some lakes in South America. The Earth doesn't actually bounce backwards and forwards. That's the movie looping. The second flyby, unfortunately, the data came down very noisily, but this transition of the moon drifting across in front of the Earth as the spacecraft flew away is quite exciting. Two asteroid flybys. They saw one called Gaspera. That was the first one they saw. The second one was Ida. And Ida is often thought that asteroids may have moons. And this was the first time we actually saw one. Tiny little moon down there, which they called Dactyl. Yonti mentioned uh, the Schumacher-Levy 9 impact. When Schumacher-Levy 9 occurred, the Earth is over here and Jupiter is over here. However, at the time... Galileo was off to one side. So these are the views we got from the Earth. These are the views we got from Galileo. We could actually see just around the corner with the spacecraft. Looking from the Earth, you're getting just the full disk face on. From Galileo, we can just see around the corner and see the actual moment of the flash of the impact of these cometary pieces. Once it had done the first two asteroid flybys, it was time to open the high-gain antenna, their big radio dish to send back all the data. Until then, they couldn't have opened it. They had a heat shield to protect it because the mission redesign meant going closer to the sun. So they had a heat shield on top, and they opened it much, much later in the mission. When they did, this is a graph that shows the current involved in opening the motors opening those ribs. And the force goes up and up and up. The current goes down, the force goes up, and eventually the motor stalled, and the antenna didn't open. What they did was take the spacecraft and nod it backwards and forwards while sending a radio signal to try and figure out how much of the antenna had opened. And it turns out that a few of the ribs of this umbrella-like structure had actually got stuck in the little mechanism that held them closed during launch. And the question is, why did these get stuck? Well, it's got something to do with the fact that it had a bit of a road trip in the USA. Um, if you want to make this journey on Google Earth, um, you can uh, get a route there. Uh, I particularly like the fact that it's, uh, it's 2,500 miles. One leg says turn onto I such and such for 1,100 miles. It's a ridiculous distance. Now, the U.S. road network's not too bad, but spacecraft are pretty delicate things. If you cover 7,635 miles, even on the finest highway, little bits of grease used to release ribs from perhaps a radio antenna on a spacecraft are going to rattle themselves loose by the time you come to deploy them about five, six years later. Things are going to get stuck, and they're not going to deploy. What did this mean for Galileo? Well, 
We're talking late 80s, early 90s at this point, so most of us were stuck on dial-up internet access, this sort of speed. Galileo's high-gain antenna, its big dish, was going to send back data at a huge speed compared to the kind of home technology of the time, 134,000 bits of information every second. But the high-gain antenna was out of commission. It did not work. So what else could Galileo use to speak to us? It had a low-gain antenna. It wasn't quite as powerful. In fact, on this graph, it doesn't even register. To give you an idea, one image, one full-frame image from Galileo, to download that with a dial-up modem would have taken about 3 minutes and 53 seconds. With the high-gain antenna, 57 seconds. With the low-gain antenna, and you can try and guess and think how long it might be, and however long you're thinking, it's longer than that. It's uh, 8 days and 21 hours. <laughs> it's funny, it's not quite that funny. <laughs> so again, we've got a problem. We've got a broken spacecraft out in space, and we can't go out there with a spanner. Somehow, we've got to improve this signal from getting what was actually 10 bits per second. You, know, you can tap out Morse code quicker than that. By improving the, the sensitivity of receivers on the ground, on the radio dishes that receive this thing, you can improve it a little bit. By bolting multiple dishes together with all their signals, adding the signal together from all the dishes you've got at one site, you can improve it a little bit more. By compressing the data on board, you can get a little bit more as well. You may think, why haven't you compressed the data already? Well, Galileo's computer was incredibly slow. Um, if any of you have been unfortunate enough to ever own one of those, the, the computer on board Galileo was actually similar kind of generation to that. And they hadn't planned on compressing all their data because it couldn't compress it quick enough to send it at that high data rate. But now that the data rate was so pitiful, it had been improved using new dishes and clever receivers, but not very much. Now they had the time to take some data, record it onto their tape, because that's what the memory was like. It was actually a tape recorder on the spacecraft. Then play it back, compress it, put it back on the tape, and then play it back at 160 bits per second, compressed. And they also decided that they have to very, very tightly constrain what it is they wanted to take data from. Essentially, what's the smallest number of bits of information we need to answer this particular scientific question or get this particular image? As a result, these level one requirements, requirements that any spacecraft has to try and meet as it's doing its mission, they managed to tick about 70% of the boxes, and they got back all of the data from a probe that they actually dropped into the atmosphere at Jupiter. Some of that data looks a little bit like this. This is one of Jupiter's moons called Io. Uh, it looks like an enormous pizza. Um, this is actually a volcano. Uh, this is an enormous volcanic caldera. Here's Io backlit with Jupiter behind it. And all these spot, spot marks here are all enormous volcanoes that can spew gas to an altitude of 200 kilometers or more. Here's actually the molten caldera on the summit of one of these volcanoes. They also took pictures of one of its moons. This is Europa, thought to be an icy moon. And these are actually kind of tectonic features of the icy plates on the surface move around, hiding an ocean underneath. A very, very good candidate looking for life beyond the Earth is the ocean underneath all this ice. This is an exceptionally high-resolution image of Ganymede. They've taken lots of images that did a very low flyby and stitched them all together. But they compressed these to send them back, and they sent them back sometimes smaller than they were taken, sometimes only little bits of them. This is the Galileo entry probe, which was actually bolted onto the bottom of Galileo and was deployed a couple of hundred days before it arrived to smash straight into the top of the atmosphere and float down under a parachute. In some ways, it's a bit analogous to Cassini having Huygens on board, but you can't land on Jupiter. It's just an enormous ball of gas, perhaps with a metallic hydrogen core in the middle. But it hit the top of the atmosphere at enormous speed, and to slow down, it needed a very, very, very strong heat shield. Here's an image that shows the size of the heat shield when they arrived and the size of the heat shield by the time the entry had finished. It had reduced from a thickness of about five and a half centimetres down to less than a centimetre thick. It had shed tens of kilograms of heat shield. It very, very nearly burnt up on the way down. It decelerated from 48 kilometres per second to 300 metres per second in two minutes. That's an average for two minutes of 230 times the force of gravity. That would rip your face off any day of the week. It then had to deploy a parachute to then drift down through the atmosphere. However, the primary G sensor was wired wrong. What that means is that the sensor there to detect when to open the parachute was wired backwards. And it was only a backup piece of software on board that was counting down from these G forces that actually deployed the parachute about 53 seconds late. But the mission worked. 
However, remember this. Primary G sense of wired wrong. Last mission I'm going to talk about is one called Genesis. This was a fairly, fairly cheap mission um, that was designed to go and explore the space between here and the sun and catch little pieces of the sun that get blown off in the solar wind. Here's the spacecraft. Here it is. The gold part is the most of the spacecraft. Solar power from these wings. And this is a sample return capsule, and inside of which it had large collector plates like this. Each of these little hexagons are made of materials like gold, sapphire, silicon, aluminium, different materials that hopefully capture different parts of the solar wind. And here's the whole thing folded up on the top of its launch vehicle, ready to go into space. Launch went fine, deployed into space, and it actually drifted away from the Earth and hovers around this. It's a point in space that you can't see, but it's where the gravity of the Earth and the Sun cancel out. And so if you're a spacecraft, if you get to there with using very, very little fuel indeed, you can hang around for as long as you want. It's where solar observatories tend to go. It's where the SOHO spacecraft, which sends back pictures of the sun every hour of every day, lives. Launched in August of 2001. Sample collected from December 2001 all the way through to August 2004. And the landing was designed for September 2004. Swing back around past the moon to synchronize for a daylight landing. And, of course, when you're landing on Earth, the most sensible way to do it is with a large parafoil, hire a helicopter, some Hollywood stunt pilots, and pluck the thing out of the sky with a big hook. <laughs> that was the plan, because they didn't want the thing to land with a hard thud for fear of damaging the collector plates inside. Here's a video that shows the landing. I think you can probably see where this is going. Wait for it. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> it hit the ground at 193 miles an hour. This is not the gentle landing they were after. Here's another photograph from a different angle. And here's the pristine sample collection. You saw the guy in the clean suit with the face mask holding this beautiful clean disc. These beautiful, beautiful, beautiful clean discs are now covered in little bits of Utah where the thing landed. And this is one of the rare pieces which actually remained comparatively intact. Most of them smashed into thousands and thousands of tiny pieces. However, scientists around the world have been given these pieces, and they have done science with them in the beginning to pull out the composition of the sun at a very, very, very accurate level based on the samples that are embedded within these little collector plates. The samples are actually embedded inside the collector plates. The atoms have buried their way in, and as a result, they can shave off the contamination from Utah and get the data back out again. So why did this thing auger in? Why didn't it land beautifully? Well, it's down to this little thing here. This is a G-sensor. Basically, it's a lump of lead bolted onto a spring. You've got a circuit, which has a wire coming in from here, and another wire coming in from here. If you accelerate this whole thing rapidly this way, this little lump is going to move to the left and connect between here and here. And as a result, the circuit gets closed. The spacecraft was due to decelerate really, really, really quickly through the atmosphere. And as it did so, this would close that circuit. And then come back down... And as it decelerated again, the deceleration coming off again, the spring would come back again, and then it would start counting down from here to here and deploy the parachute. One of the unique things with Genesis is that it's a, a, a spacecraft mishap which we have in our hands. It's come back. We can take a screwdriver to it and find out what on earth went wrong. This is a circuit diagram from one of the boards inside the spacecraft. And here and here are the two G-sensors. Here's an x-ray of the circuit board after it had crashed. I'll zoom in so, that, so you can see a little bit better. You can see those little shapes with the lump of lead and the springs. And as you can see, on the orientation of these, you need to accelerate the thing this way to get those lead weights to go backwards and connect the circuit. Unfortunately, the force of acceleration during entry was this way. So the spacecraft never knew that it was decelerating. It never knew to start counting down to open the parachute. There is an analogy here. 
This chap is called Edward A. Murphy Jr. He's an engineer, and he was involved in testing what happens to people when you decelerate them very, very quickly. They were trying to find out what might happen if you had an ejector seat, what might happen if you had a car crash or a plane crash. And these were done at a place called Holloman Air Force Base, and he brought a whole load of test instruments to bolt onto these, these, kind of these rocket sleds, force sensors, strain gauges, accelerometers. And they had about 16 of these things. And he gave them to a junior engineer to plug into the data recorder that was going to record all this data. They did these really very, very dangerous tests with these people. These people had kind of retinal hemorrhages. They had detached retinas. They had bruising all over their faces just to find out what happens to people when you accelerate them really, really quickly. Every single one of the 16 sensors was wired backwards. If there is more than one way to do a job, and one of those ways will result in a disaster, then somebody will do it that way. This is, in the very truest sense, the actual derivation of Murphy's Law. This is where it comes from. Genesis is no better modern interpretation, really, of Murphy's Law. And as a bonus question to wrap up, to kind of see if you get where Genesis was going wrong, here is the crash site. What is wrong with this movie? After any accident happens with spacecraft, or something goes wrong, something goes missing, something crashes, there is an accident investigation report. An accident investigation report said, you know, you didn't do enough testing, you made too many assumptions, your management was dreadful, you didn't have enough money, whatever. But it also had a second chapter telling them all the things they did wrong after the crash had happened as well. Here's the photographer taking pictures of the crashed lander. Why is that a bad thing for him to do? How is Genesis supposed to land with a big parachute? How do you deploy a parachute on a spacecraft with a mortar? Where is it going to deploy? Out the top of the spacecraft. And it hadn't deployed. It could well have deployed at some point and smacked him straight in the face. He is an exceptionally lucky guy to still be alive. It never went off, but it could well have done. Kind of a procedural error. They weren't expecting this to happen, so they didn't really have a set of rules to do, you know, know what to do once it had. I'm going to close with this, um, in that you know, these, some of these mistakes seem quite funny, some of them seem quite you know, horrifically boneheaded. However, in all of these cases, the science has still happened. They've got the data out of it at the end. And so this is describing another spacecraft accident with a spacecraft called Soho. I think it's a true testament to, to kind of the genius of the engineers who build these things. Although human error led to the failure, it was human ingenuity and perseverance that brought it back to life. And I hope you've enjoyed a little bit of an encore. Thank mm-hmm. you.